And so uh, it's great once again to uh, have this moment to be able to share in the word of God. And uh, I believe that uh, the Lord is going to bless us, uh, those who are going to watch live and those who are going to listen and those who are going to come to this material later. And uh, this is Sammy Wilberforce. And uh, I'm glad that uh, we can speak about this topic. It is um, something that uh, we have gone through before, but uh, repetition makes impression. So uh, I'd like us to look at the ancient Hebrew wedding model or what we call the Jewish wedding model. And then uh, uh, we shall see in connection with the, 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 the relationship that Christ sustains with his church, how Actually, this is a serious matter for those who are contemplating to enter into friendship, um, courtship, and then uh, engagement, and then marriage. It is not something just uh, to find ourselves in accidentally, as people say that, oh, I, I got myself into it. And so without much, uh, I like to pray and then, um, yeah, I like to pray and then um, uh, we can be able to enter into the session fully. And so wherever you are, uh, we can kneel down for a word of prayer. If you can, if you cannot, then uh, you can bow down for a word of prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the nice weather and thank you for the day that has passed and the new day that is before us. As we start it, we pray that uh, your countenance may shine upon us and you may help us to understand your will Above all, we don't want just to understand, but give us the strength to walk in it. In the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I'm glad that uh, I can be able to share with the brethren on this platform. Uh, I pray that you invite uh, as many as you can. And uh, uh, it's a great material, good deal of material we have to deal with. And so I pray that um, the, the Lord will help us to get what we can get uh, in this uh, time. Otherwise, uh, if uh, there is something solemn that uh, we need to pray about and before we engage ourselves in is uh, the issue of uh, marriage. And uh, this is something that is neglected by so many people. But um, it is... Uh, the institution that uh, was meant to reflect the relationship that uh, Christ has with his, his church. And so um, when we are contemplating to take such a step, it is good that um, we be able to consult God in every step we make. Um, I like to say that um, in this series, we will look at the ancient Hebrew wedding, wedding model and then uh, understanding this cultural aspect of the scriptures will help us understand scriptures on uh, a deeper level that uh, it will bring scriptures closer to our heart more than how we have ever viewed them ever before. And uh, it will help us understand things in regards to prophecy because as we shall be continuing with the series coming to an end, we shall be privileged if God gives us life to look at uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 25, the story of uh, the 10 virgins, five wise and five foolish. It will also help us to understand our relationship to our Messiah and our bridegroom. You understand that the church is called the bride and Christ is called the bridegroom. And so we have to go into the aspect of how does Christ himself quote his church? How does he enter into a friendship with him and courtship engagement and then at last marriage? And not only marriage, it is after marriage that the life beyond is of most important because um, after everything has been accomplished in this earth, uh, Christ will dwell with uh, his bride forever and that uh, there shall be no separating, there shall be no divorce, there shall be no wrangles or quarrels or that thing. And so 
when we enter into a marriage relationship, it's a big, big, big challenge because we have to reflect the image of Christ after all these things. It will also help us understand our work in this faith and how we ought to be acting and uh, preparing, how we ought to be acting and preparing. Now, I, I like us, I, I like to take you through the stages of um, uh, a Hebrew wedding model, an ancient Hebrew, Hebrew wedding model. These were the steps, and uh, I, I hope wherever you have, you have a pen and a paper because um, this is information that uh, you need to write down so that you may revisit it. If you can write it down, then you'll have to visit the page uh, of uh, Brother Fred and be able to watch uh, uh, the, the, the presentation and take your notes. If uh, he will upload on YouTube, well and good, he can give you the link, but he'll be sending you the link to his Facebook page so that you may be able to review the issue. And so, these were the steps that were followed when somebody wanted to get into a, a wedding in the ancient Hebrew. But you, you may ask yourself, uh, uh, why should we choose the Hebrew wedding model? Because these are the very people that entered into a marriage uh, covenant, uh, something of sort with Jesus Christ, because um, we find that in the book of Isaiah, he is asking Israel, where is the divorce, the certificate of divorcement that I gave unto you? I think I can project this quickly. In Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourself, and for your transgression is your mother put away. And so uh, uh, I, I was reading from uh, the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 1. And so you find that uh, Christ himself entered into a marriage relationship with Israel or with the Jewish uh, nation. And uh, the Jewish nation is composed of what we call uh, Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the 12 tribes of Israel are not um, per se limited to that nation, but when God was entering into covenant, the marriage covenant with them, uh, through them, they were just to be the, the, um, the, the depositaries of the truth to the whole world. And all those people who could have accepted the gospel became the Israel of God. Whether you are from the Jewish background or from a Gentile background, there's no eunuch, uh, there's no Greek. There's no Jew, there's no Gentile before the Lord. All is the family of God, those who accept Jesus Christ. So when he was entering into a marriage relationship with them, this was on a smaller scale of uh, the greater thing that will happen when all the saints are gathered to together in him. And so these uh, were the steps that... Um, uh, they passed through in entering or doing a Hebrew wedding. Modern day weddings and the lead up to, the, to them is much different to how weddings were planned and conducted back in biblical times. There were several stages to a Hebrew wedding. And I want you to notice the first step was called the Shiduhin. That is the matchmaking stage. And uh, it, it's interesting as we go through this stuff. So the first step was called the Shiduhim. That is the matchmaking stage. And then we have the Erusin, the betrothal stage, or what you call the betrothal stage. And we shall look at that. And then we had the Nusuin, that is the marriage itself. That is the marriage itself. And so these very steps, the Shiduhim, the Erusin and the Nusuin were very much important stages of the Hebrew wedding model. In the Shiduhin or the Shiduhin, 
you find that um, it was uh, a matter of knowing each other. In the sanctuary model, it is uh, it contains the, the 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 camp, and then it contains the courtyard, and then we had what we call the uh, uh, what we call the the erusin, that is the betrothal stage where actually you entered into the covenant with uh, the person whom you are going to get marriage. And this uh, was the courtship and the engagement stage, which you now move from um, the courtyard, you enter into the holy place and uh, you people, you become one in some way, yet you are not married, but you are one. This is the step you will find that uh, Joseph and Mary were in before Mary was fine to be having pregnancy. And you understand that it was just in engagement stage, we shall see that. And um, in that stage of betrothal stage, somebody whom you were engaged to was already your wife, but uh, you had not taken that person to, to, to the house to live with, or you didn't. Um, relate with them, uh, you didn't have an intercourse with them, I mean, uh, a, a sexual intercourse. And so um, that is the Erusin and uh, the Nusuin. This is um, uh, the marriage itself where actually you enter into the most holy place and then you are intimate with Christ, you are close with him, and then it uh, you are united forever, you are sealed forever. And then uh, 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 you have that uh, uh, covenantal uh, 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 cup that you drink and then uh, uh, you are given your wife and then you go to honeymoon with him and that is what we are expecting the second coming of Jesus Christ to seal the marriage and then uh, the, you go to what uh, do we call it uh, the honeymoon stage which is the thousand years in heaven and then after the honeymoon, then you go to your home with your wife and live there after forever. Whereas we shall come from heaven after a thousand years and be able to live with Jesus Christ uh, uh, forever. Fred, can you help some people on the WhatsApp? And so uh, these were the important steps that um, were in the Jewish, the ancient Hebrew wedding model. And... Uh, each stage had a certain ceremonies and practices associated with it. The very practices in the camp and in the courtyard were different from the uh, ceremonies in the holy place and the ceremonies in the most holy place. And the requirements in these stages were also different. The, the commitment during these stages were so different from uh, what we see uh, in these times that uh, we are living in. Brother Sami, you are muted kindly. Okay, uh, sorry for that. I was saying that uh, uh, we, we want now to look at uh, these steps. And so I was saying each stage had certain ceremonies and practices associated with it. You find that uh, in the Jewish, in the ancient Hebrew wedding model, that each stage had certain ceremonies and practices associated with it. So was it the sanctuary service. In what happened in the camp was different from what happened in the courtyard. It was different from what happened in the holy place. It was different from what happened in the most holy place. And the level of commitment in these stages of the sanctuary and uh, the Jewish wedding model 
really got intense as you went from one step to another. And these overtones, overtones of this can be found throughout the scriptures. And uh, this is what I want us to look at. <clears throat> the first step was the, was, uh, the Shiduhin. This is, was the first step in the ancient Hebrew wedding model. Now, um, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we read that Elohim, that is God, said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. Let us, let this sing in for a minute. That um, I was saying, sometimes we write down some things we want our partners to have. Uh, and uh, the whole story of God is put out. While Genesis 2.18 says that it is God who said, it is not good for a man to be alone. And so I'll make him a partner. And so in the process of Shiduhin, where actually you start contemplating about um, your married life, it is not you who is going to find out which is the right person, but actually it is God who is going to find you a right person. And uh, you may ask the question that people ask, will God come from heaven to choose you a partner? No. What God will do is um, he will bring together people whom he know can live together. And uh, while uh, he'll be doing that, there is something that you should be doing and the other person should be doing, praying that uh, it is God who leads you to this matrimonial or to this matrimony, that is this communion or uh, to this companionship. And so you will not choose a partner because uh, they are so pleasing to you. You will have to choose a partner because it is so pleasing to God. Because it is God whom say, who said that it's not good for a man to be alone. And so uh, much has to depend on what God says rather than on what you yourself will say. And so much has to do with what the word of God says and uh, the principles he has put there for two people to come together rather than your own wishes. And we shall be seeing some of these things as we continue. So Shiduhin refers to the preliminary arrangements prior to a legal betrothal. Um, in ancient times, marriage was looked upon as more of an alliance for reasons of survival or practicality. And also the concept of romantic love remained a secondary issue if considered at all. Romantic love grew over time. Now, I, I want you to consider, or I want us to consider the two things that um, in ancient time marriage was looked upon as more of an alliance for reasons of survival or practicality. And the concept of romantic love remained a secondary issue if considered at all. Romantic love grew over time. What do we mean by that? <clears throat> when someone chose a partner, it was not per se that um, it was for his own good because a wife belonged to the community at that time. Something that you don't find that is considered so much in this time that we live in that when you are married, you are just not marrying that um, uh, this man belongs to you or this woman belongs to you, but uh, you marry with an understanding that um, this woman is going to become a daughter in a community or a strange community, and she has to fit in. And then a woman has to consider that this man is going to become a son to our community, which is strange to him, and he has to fit in because I'm um, getting married to him. And so it was more, more of a family alliance, two families coming together rather than um, just two people coming together. And uh, we can see that in the, in the story of Jesus and the church. And so when Christ is marrying the church, is entering into a marriage alliance with the church, he's not marrying for himself. The wife has to be fitting to the father and to the angels. and also when uh, the church is accepting Christ, they're accepting someone to fit in their own family. And that is why Christ has to become a human being 
to fit in the human family and the human family accepts him and then he goes back to the father to report that I have been accepted in that community. And so this community, I can bring it unto you. And the father says, okay, if you have been accepted in that community, then let me investigate also this community or this lineage and see if I can accept it to be part of uh, the divine family. And so marriage was not considered uh, a, a, an institution of two people, but marriage was con considered as a, an alliance between two families to come together and make up a strong family. The second thing was that um, marriage, uh, what we call love was considered to be a secondary thing. They were there were some things which were considered to be primary and not um, the, the love issue. And uh, I'll try to demonstrate this in the Bible. And uh, the book of uh, Genesis, the book of uh, Genesis, um, Genesis and uh, Genesis chapter 24, I want you to see this. This is the marriage between um, Isaac and Rebecca. Now, I want you to see what was happening before Rebecca was brought to Isaac. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 24, verse 63, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Now, remember that um, Isaac had never seen Rebecca, but then he went to the field to pray that whatsoever Eliezer would bring will be fitting unto the community. Remember the covenant that um, the oath that uh, Eliezer had ended in with Abraham that uh, he will go to look for a wife for Isaac. And then if he doesn't find a befitting woman amongst the family members of uh, Abraham, then he'll come back. He'll be released from that oath. And so he goes to look for a wife for Isaac and he finds a good girl in, in the Angus family. And then Isaac has never met uh, actually um Rebecca and so let me bring you back to this point as uh, I explain this the concept of romantic love remained a secondary issue if considered at all romantic love grew over time now let us go back to our verse in the book of Genesis Genesis chapter 24 so these are people who you cannot say they were uh, attracted to each other facially or romantic because they had never seen each other. And uh, if there was any love that existed at that moment that Isaac saw Rebecca, it was mutual love and not romantic love because uh, romantic love is something that grows when you get used to somebody and uh, there are some things that uh, really makes uh, the whole issue uh, a chemistry uh, as you continue living together. And so Isaac went out to meditate and what was he meditating about? His future life and uh, the person he was going to live with. And um, behold, he sees the camels coming and Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. Verse 65 says, for she had said unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, it is my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself. This is a sign of uh, uh, what we find in Ephesians that uh, wives be submissive to your own husbands as if it were in the Lord. This is a sign of humility that she shall be subject to Isaac forever. Verse 66 says, and the servants told Isaac all things that he had done. 67, as we look at this issue of romantic uh, 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 um, uh, uh, what uh, being attracted to each other in verse 67 it says and Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebecca 
she became his wife. Look at that procedure. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted, comforted after his mother's death. So there is the whole procedure that if there is a love issue, it becomes secondary. That uh, there are some things which should be looked at before you think about being attracted to somebody romantically. The, the reason why people end up most of the time in adultery and fornication is that they are attracted to each other romantically uh, in romance before they look at each other's traits or character. And then you find that uh, most of uh, the friendship and courtship is messed up because the, the priorities that people have are uh, different priorities from what the Bible outlines as a priority of uh, a husband or a wife. Then in the Shudihim, it was generally the fathers that did the deliberating at this stage. Now, it is interesting. Um, we say that uh, times have changed, don't we? And it's true times have changed when we say that because it is not much these days to hear that uh, <clears throat> the father goes to look for a wife for a son. Not that uh, the fathers are not willing, but uh, this generation has changed a lot. And uh, I know people can laugh and uh, people can do all they can do about this statement that uh, it is the father who did the looking uh, for a wife, for a son. But this is biblical because uh, if we go back to the Bible, we understand that it is God who looked for Adam's, Adam for a wife. Adam did not go looking for a wife. God looked for a wife for Adam. Abraham sent Eliezer to go and look for a wife for Isaac. And uh, when you go to Jacob, were it not that um, he stole the, the birthright from his brother, then either the brother or anyone in that family could have gone to look for a wife for him. And this is how it was in the Jewish wedding model, the ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model. And that is how it has to be today because in this, when the parents are involved in uh, choosing somebody whom we'll spend time with or lifetime with, and as we said that this is an alliance of uh, two families coming together and communities coming together, then uh, no one will want to bring somebody in the home who the parents and the community will not uh, agree with. And so we, we say that time has changed, but God has not changed. We are told that we should be involving um, our parents in selecting or uh, in choosing our partners or in uh, um, counseling before God gives us those partners. In fact, without involving our parents, we violate the sixth, uh, the fifth um, commandment, which says that uh, children obey the, uh, the parents in the Lord so that the days may be long in the land that the Lord giveth unto you. And um, also we shall be avoiding the commandment, is it commandment number eight, thou shalt not steal. You will find that in letters to the young lovers, which says that uh, a young man who enjoys the affection of a young lady and be known to her parents breaks the eighth commandment or does something which is against uh, the parents. From secret communications, they can develop love for each other, but the hand which wrote thou shalt not steal records in heaven that is stealing of affections. So the parents of the both sides should be involved uh, when you are contemplating such as uh, a steps, all the parents should be involved so that um, there should be no stealing of that affection because uh, this was uh, a family affair. So it was common for children to be betrothed to each other. It was generally the fathers that did the del deliberating at this stage. It was common for children to be betrothed to each other. However, it was seldom that marriages were forced young people that had no interest for each other. And then in ultra-Orthodox Judaism today, many marriages are still arranged by a marriage broker or a matchmaker called the Shadhan. And so uh, in the, the Shadhan or the matchmaker is um, somebody like Eliezer who can 
spot a lady or can spot a man and bring them together. And this doesn't have to be, uh, 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 I mean, this person has to be so spiritual because marriage is something spiritual. Marriage is not something uh, uh, common or something regular. It is something sacred. Marriage is something spiritual because there is the mystery of the two people becoming one in spirit when they are married. And it is way more spiritual than uh, people just think. That is why Paul tells us in Corinthians, whoever that is joined to a hallowed becomes one body. It's counted that the two becomes hallowed. Uh, if you join yourself to a hallowed, they become one body. And so if you are joined to a hallowed, you become a hallowed. And so it is something more spiritual for two people to come together because it's an illustration of Christ and the church. It is, it is considered an exalted and holy vocation to find and arrange a good marital match called a shiduch, shiduch between a man and a woman. So the, the matchmaker or the broker is called the shaduhan. And um, uh, um, this process of um, matchmaking or arranging a good marital match is called the shiduch where actually between a man and a woman, and this has to be done with very spiritual people. And uh, maybe God willing, we shall uh, have some stories about this. And so you find that uh, even in some churches, pastors are brokers or they are the shadihan of uh, two people marrying, or you find that a mother or a father is uh, a shadhan of uh, a shidduh, that is uh, the, the two people coming together. And uh, this is befitting because there is a kind of mutual respect when uh, a spiritual person or an older person getting involved in two young people coming together to become a, a, a husband and uh, a wife. Now, th that time is moving so fast. But in Judges chapter 14, <clears throat> looking at this process of uh, Shiduhin, which is the first process, and uh, Shimshon, that is Samson, went to Timna and saw a woman in Timna of the daughters of the Philistines. And he went up and informed his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timna of the daughters of the Philistines, and now take her for me for a wife. But his father and mother said unto him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brothers or among all my people that you should take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Shimshon or Samson said to his father, Take her for me, for she is pleasing in my eyes. You know how the story went in Judges chapter 14 and Judges 15. But um, the point I wanted to bring out that uh, even in the Bible, if the parent was not involved in getting a wife for a son, when a son saw some girl that pleased him, he didn't go and um, uh, 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 really uh, uh, approach the lady, but went back to the parents and informed them that I have seen so and so. What do you have to say about that person? And um, the parents could cancel. And you see the father of Samson saying, is asking him, is there, is there is, is not any lady among us who you are really, you, we, you can get pleased to and you can get married to? And then Samson, because the devil was taking hold of him, he says that it pleases me. Not that I am looking some, for somebody who will please you people, but I have some, found somebody who pleases me. Now, this issue originated with Satan, that Satan wanted only the things that pleased him, not the things that pleased the heavenly father. And you know from that he was thrown from heaven and came on this earth. Whenever we take steps that only please us and we do not consider how other people will feel, then we can be sure that we are headed to a downfall rather than a uh, 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 rising and standing uh, uh, strong in uh, any step that we are making. And so 
uh, it was not customary for a young man to see a lady and approach her. He could go back to the uh, elders or the parents and uh, inform them of uh, the happenings. And then the, the father will sit with the, the, the son and be able to discuss these things. And so in Judges chapter 4, verses 14, verse 4. However, his father and mother did not know that it was Elohim that he was uh, uh, he, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistine. For at that time, the Philistine were ruling over Israel or Israel. Then Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyard of Timnah and saw a young lion um, came roaring at, at him. It was during this stage that the proposal was made. Thus began the process of setting the terms for the marriage. And so you find a young lady and you go back to your parent and um, you don't go to approach the lady. In fact, um, there can be friendship in the modern uh, 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 in the modern society, but uh, when you look closely to the ancient Hebrew wedding model, uh, I don't see much of the man and the woman interacting so much until they are affectionate to each other. That is when they go to the parents. This is not what you find in the Bible. There was a consultation with the parents and then the parents in that ancient Hebrew wedding model, they went to the parents of uh, the young lady and uh, they were able to discuss with the, the parents of this lady. And uh, remember Eliezer, when uh, he went to Laban, he said that um, I have come and uh, I have seen your daughter is okay. And um, I have prayed and the Lord has given me the sign that I asked him if this can be a wife to our son. And so if you are willing, let me know. If you are not willing, withhold me not here. I go back to the people who send me. And so this is what you find the father of Samson doing. He goes to the parents of the lady. And this starts the process of these people getting to know each other and see if uh, their customs and uh, can agree and uh, they can make up um, a union. And so <clears throat> the next stage was the, the throttle stage. And uh, let me see if I'll finish this stage, I'll not go to, to Nisuin, which is the marriage stage. I'll try and deal with Erosin, which is the courtship and um, the engagement. But then uh, I have just covered the Shiduhin, which is the friendship but and going to see the parents of uh, the lady, if they can accept you to start a friendship and eventually uh, courtship and engagement, then it was okay. So the next stage in the Jewish wedding model was the, the Erosin. <clears throat> Once the match had been made, the terms of marriage will be made and set in the form of ketubah. This is a writing. And then the ketubah was a legally binding document. It is primary purpose was to protect the bride. Now, you know, these days we meet um, a young lady, young men meet a young lady. They start talking to her and then um, uh, they, they go to the parents when um, they want, they, they have finished everything. All they want is to pay the dowry. This was not so in that time. The moment you are going to pay the dowry, th there are some things you had gone through and uh, it had been uh, uh, and uh, it had been uh, approved that um, the, 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 the courtship or the engagement should go on. So in the Erusin, we are told that the ketuba or a legally binding document, it is primary purpose was to protect the bride. Once you start having a courtship or an engagement with a lady, you are to pay dowry, but you will not go with this lady. 
you pay the dowry, and then we had that betrothal stage, which took uh, 12 months or one year. You have paid the dowry so that you cannot go to date another lady. Your dowry is somewhere and everyone is watching what you are doing. And so that was to protect the bride so that, uh, you know, men today, today you will go to this lady, you met another lady and you start flirting with her the same way you flirted with the other lady and so on. But this was not in the ancient Hebrew wedding model. You pay the dowry and you continue with your life single. Yet this woman is called your wife, yet you are not living with her. She is living at her home. And uh, so if you do anything stupid, actually you lose your dower that way. And so it was a form of discipline. Uh, and uh, I think it was the best thing that could ever happen. Bring back the old days, the back uh, the old days religion is good. It was good for our fathers, it should be good for us. The father of the bride will use his wisdom to look out for the best interest of his daughter. And so the bride was seen as being completely under her father's control. For example, if a man sleeps with a virgin, they generally got married, but her father had to consent. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28, when a man finds a girl who is a maiden, who is not engaged, and he seizes her and lies with her, and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the girl's father 50 pieces of silver, and she is to be his wife because he has humbled her. He is not allowed to put her away all these days. And that is why you find that uh, in the olden days, in the Hebrew ancient days, we didn't have much of fornication because if you were known that you had slept with a lady, then you will pay the dowry for that lady. And either the father can consent that you marry her or he refuses. He takes the dowry, but he can refuse you are not going to marry her because the reason was this, every woman in Israel was waiting to give birth to Messiah. And so to defile any lady before you got married to her was to exclude her from the blessing of marrying the savior of the world. And so it was not a simple thing to find a man and a lady together fornicating or doing adultery because every lady in Israel was preserved for carrying the Messiah, for giving birth to Messiah. And so if you are find that you have done such a thing in Israel, you had to pay the bride price because one thing also you have to understand that uh, no man in Israel could marry a lady whom they knew had been defiled or had slept with a man because the man knew that that blessing of giving birth or um, being the father of the Messiah was taken away from him. And so uh, uh, these things only happen in our days because we don't understand how that was so important to the Hebrews. Now, the reason why we should keep our lives pure as it were the ancient Israel is because there are certain blessings that the Lord will want us to carry in our families that we really forfeit when we defile ourselves before marriages. And also, we have to understand that um, the Lord wants to present us before his father, virgins, in a way that uh, we have not been involved in extramarital affairs, but um, we have kept ourselves pure unto the Lord. And so this thing is more spiritual than we always think of when uh, we are engaging in it. So the bride was seen as being completely under the father's control. For example, if a man sleeps with a virgin, they generally got married, but her father had to consent. So I was saying he can accept the dowry, but he won't give you the girl also. And it was a shame in Israel for such a thing to happen. And when a man entices a maiden who is not engaged and lies with her, he shall certainly pay the bride price for her to be his wife. Today, you find that, you know, if this thing was strictly observed today, you will not find fornication because let us say, uh, today you are found with a lady, you will have to pay the bride price. If, uh, the, if you look at uh, 50, uh, that was 50 silvers, it will be like uh, 
a lot of cows in these days, a lot of cows. So if today you are found, you pay the bride price. You can, maybe you pay 10 cows. Tomorrow, if you find, you pay another 10 cows. The other day, 10 cows and so on. By the time that really you are married, you are a very poor man. And I, I don't think any man can afford that. And if you are found to be licentious in such a way, one of the things that was done is to uh, 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 really uh, kill you with stones. If you are found that this was your behavior, then your father will bring you at the gates of the elders in Israel and say that this son of mine doesn't obey me. And so he'll be the first one to cast a stone. But uh, you can say that, uh, oh, the Jewish law doesn't apply to us today. We cannot stone anyone. But remember, the Father in heaven sees what you are doing, and you are just excluding yourself from uh, the, 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 the eternal life. When you continue with this licentiousness of uh, flirting with this girl and this and this and this and uh, going around doing communication with everyone that you get on your way, you are really excluding yourself um, uh, to having eternal life. And uh, I'll come to this issue of dating this girl and dating that girl how really it affects us um, physiologically, emotionally, and uh, spiritually. It is not something good uh, at all because um, in the process, there are physical chemicals. There is, there's chemistry that happens that um, leaves some brokenness in our, in our hearts and uh, in our bodies that even when we enter into the marriages, the enjoyment that the Lord had meant us to have if we had kept ourselves pure, it is not there because you have met with this girl, you have flirted with her and uh, there are some certain kind of hormones that are reproduced in the process, which actually, again, you meet with the other lady, they are reproduced and the other lady and they are reproduced and you find yourself that you are having a lot of imbalances and you know, that this affects us spiritually because um, uh, our minds need to be pure to comprehend spiritual things. But as you are doing this, actually your mind cannot be dwelling on holy things. It is now being controlled by the lower nature instead of the higher nature. And so it is not something that you may think that you are enjoying life, but you are destroying yourself physically and spiritually. And uh, you say, oh, now, Preacher, what can I do? Because this has been my life all along. I told if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The Lord can give you back what you lost if you give your life back to him. And so it is not a moment of despairing. It is not a message of condemnation if you have been involved in this. In uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, we are told that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so if you give your heart to Jesus Christ today, he looks at you as if you have never seen and looks at you as a virgin, a person who has never involved yourself in this thing. But then he will want you to walk in pureness of life rather than repeating the same things that you have been. And so let me see if I can bring this to an end. I, I won't go to Nisuin, um, which is the marriage part, but let me try to finish the Erusin. So, if her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he pays according to the bride price of maidens. So you will pay the bride price, but you will not marry this lady. And it should be like that in this day that uh, you, you see it is, it is embarrassing and it's shame that uh, young men are impregnating even uh, the school girls and just they continue with their education and the young ladies are left there having nothing and their life is destroyed. Those men should be paying the bride price if they have to be allowed to continue to be living. And this is biblical. So the Erusin, the Ketubah, consisted of several stipulations, the conditions and requirements of the groom and bride to each other. Now, it is interesting that uh, when you went to the parents of the girl mm -hmm. to ask for an engagement, and uh, courtship and engagement, you are told the responsibilities of a man to a wife and the responsibilities of a wife to a man. 
And then you will sign that you are going to be responsible for these things that uh, you have, they have been read to you. And, uh, you know, sometimes we live with parents and they don't tell us the responsibilities of a man in marriage, or even the daughters are grown in ignorance of what they are supposed to be doing in marriages. And that is why you find that a young lady is married. She doesn't know anything to do with marriage, yet she is in marriage. A young man marries and he doesn't know the responsibilities of her husband in, in the house. Sometimes we think uh, that uh, the, the, the way that we see people behaving in their marriages is the way that they should be behaving. No. When you went to a courtship and an engagement uh, to, to the parents of the lady, they were able to read to you what are the requirements of a man, a husband, to a wife. And you had to agree to these things before they accepted your dowry. Today, people just go and uh, they say, oh, uh, I have come. We, I would like to have your daughter. And uh, I'm ready to pay for dowry, even if uh, you want the dowry. And then the, the very first thing that the parents go, oh, OK, we have uh, schooled our daughter and so on and so on. Uh, uh, we would like uh, you to give us 200,000 or 300,000. You know, that is a business if you never knew. The, the way that marriage is conducted and courtship is, and engagements are conducted in these days is a form of uh, business. And many people will miss heaven because of this thing. When you, you consider the price of your daughter before considering her happiness, where she's going, you are selling your child. People don't know what they do, but you know, many of the people who are in marriages, they were bought. They were not given in marriage, they were sold in marriage. And uh, I pray that Lord, that uh, this will never happen with the people who will be able to watch this forum, uh, this uh, production or these videos, because um, there are some things we don't understand. First of all, the parents of the lady has to understand is our girl going to find a home where she will still be a daughter? Or she will go to a place where she'll be just strange and unprotected and her life will not be a life as she has been living here. You know, when a daughter is married to a, a certain place, the life that she was living at her home has to be continued in that place because she has not ceased to be a human being. She is a human being. And so her amenities, her needs, and all this stuff have to be considered before even the bride price is um, negotiated. That is why you find that uh, some good parents, they even say, don't, don't ask, uh, give me a certain amount for my daughter. They say, oh, are you able to keep my daughter happy? Are you able to provide for her? Are you able to be a good parent to the children you will have? then have my daughter, I, I don't need anything. And so it is on the part of the man to go and think, how can I appreciate the mother who breastfed this girl for all these 25 years and clothed her and all that stuff. The, the one who carried her in the womb for nine months and all this stuff. You will find that mostly the parents who understand the erucine part, they don't ask for the dowry. They just say, I have given you my daughter. And then it is logical for a man to know that um, I'm taking a person who was educated, I'm taking a person who was clothed, I'm taking a person who was fed and given a character to be a wife. And so I have to appreciate my in-laws. And so um, this is something that um, the people are taken through. They will um, be taken through the conditions and requirements of the groom and bride to each other. How do you make your husband happy? How can how do you study his character and uh, be able to work for his happiness? And then the husband also, how can you work for the happiness of your wife? What are the weakness of our daughters? What are the weakness of our, uh, our son? And then these two the, the, these characters will be brought together and reviewed to see if uh, uh, they can be able to live together. But you ask, how does this apply to the Bible itself? You know, 
what I'm just talking about is the stage that uh, Christ is in with the church. Looking at the condition of each other, you look at the condition of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ looks at your condition. And the parents on the both sides, the two families on the both sides are studying each other if they can live happily together. And so this is the process that we are in in the spiritual matters. And this is what was considered literally when you went for courtship and engagement to pay the dowry. And so the bride's estate inventory and accounting of assets, cash, property, livestock, business, it is that the bride contributed to the new husband's estate when she married him. Also, it will be considered, what are you having? You know, sometimes we think that uh, once we are married, we don't have an obligation to make sure that um, we contribute something to the family. But then we shall look at Proverbs chapter 31, that woman, that um, you are not only married as a lady to take everything that the man has, but you have to bring something into the family. You can check that in Proverbs chapter 31, that uh, this lady can be able to provide for her family too. She complements what the husband has. But then also we shall be looking at the sphere of a woman. What is the sphere of a woman? What is she allowed to do to bring livelihood to the family and help in financial upbringing uh, 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 of the family? And what is she not allowed to do to bring finances into the family? Also, there is no father who gave the daughter to a man who didn't know how to provide. And that is why in ancient Hebrew or Jewish culture, it was the duty of the father to make sure that a son has a job. Where do you find this in the Bible? Before God gave Adam a wife, he gave him a garden that had everything so that when Adam marries, the wife will not have a problem. How shall she feed? What shall she wear? And all this stuff. So also the happiness of the lady was to be looked into. What is the man having? Or is my daughter going to come from me and be given to another family and start suffering? This man is lazy. This man is idle. He can't upkeep himself. How is he going to upkeep the lady? And so these are the issues that were looked in. What does the man have? And what does the wife have? Now, when uh, the man had given the dowry, and I, I'm trying just to run ahead of this. When the man gave the dowry that he had, on the wedding day, the dowry he had given, half of it was given back to this man because uh, he had to start a life with another person and it will not be the same as he was living a single person. So whatever he had given in those days um, uh, for as a marriage dowry or a, a bride price, on the wedding day, on the day of Nusuin, he was given half of that. So if um, you went and negotiated dowry and you were told, you are going to give 100,000 for the dower of the lady. On the day of marriage, when you are being given a lady, they returned 50,000 with it. But today also people have become thieves. You pay the dower, and on the day of wedding, no one is returning anything. And that is something that needs to be protested. But again, as Christian, what can we protest about? We have been called in this life to endure even those who misuse us. And so uh, this is something that should be taught in church because people are taking advantages of others. And uh, you are taking a lady, you are going to live with her forever. And so you need somewhere to start. And good parents should be able to provide for their children. And so this was part of what was done. A half of uh, the dowry was returned. And then as we bring this to an and the dowry, the mohar, the price of the bride paid by the groom's father and or groom to the bride's father when they agreed on this thing. So um, in ancient days, marriage was not an agreement between two individuals, but between two families. I said that 
The newly married man usually did not find a new home for himself, but occupied a nook in his father's house. I see these customs still uh, in our places. I don't know if uh, the places you come from, uh, you have uh, this um, custom. When uh, we marry in uh, our, our in uh, our community, a man uh, who is newly married is not allowed to go and start cooking in his own house until maybe after a year. So he is supposed to eat in his father's house for one year. And why was it so? So that the bond between the new daughter in the family, that is the wife to the son, uh, may develop between that daughter and the mother of uh, the husband so that uh, they may come to a place that uh, she integrates in the family as a daughter in that family. The, the mother can be able to learn her and uh, the daughter can be able or the wife can be able to learn the mother-in-law and so on. And uh, in this, um, in this uh, situation, you remember in the ancient Hebrew that um, the man didn't interact so much with the lady. So when she comes to the family, she will have to live with the mother-in-law for some time. They, they are living with the husband, but she is eating. They are eating in the family of uh, the man. Why? Because the mother-in-law will tell the lady the interests of the man, what he loves to eat, what he loves to listen to, what he loves to wear and all that, so that uh, this lady may know that, uh, oh, my husband are the things that he gets along with better. And then the mother-in-law will be able to tell the daughter-in-law that uh, this and this, this, this son of mine do not like, and this and this, this family do not like. And so it is, uh, this one year in marriage is a training by the mother-in-law so that uh, at least the daughter or the wife may fit in the family. And these many uh, quarrels and wrangles may be reduced because she has been taught thoroughly how to live with that family and how to live with that community. She will be told, oh, this family and this family, that is not a good family uh, to live with, uh, to interact with, or uh, if you interact with it, interact with it at this level and not at this level. And so it was um, a session of teaching. And uh, we find that uh, the reason why many women do not integrate in the community that, that they are married into these days is because they don't have time with their mothers-in-law and um, or uh, they don't have so much time with their husband to be taught this and these things so that uh, they may know how to better the marriage rather than to keep on quarreling day and night. And so. Uh, they were supposed, the newly married man usually did not find a new home for himself, but occupied a nook in his father's house. And today, maybe because um, uh, the people don't want to live with their parents, but uh, they will still cook with them. If you decide you don't want, it's upon you, but uh, there is uh, something that is good. I know there are questions which are going to be raised on these presentations, and um, hopefully you can write them down so that we shall deal with them. The family of the groom gained and the family of the bride lost a valuable member who helped with household tasks. And so um, when um, uh, a person was uh, married, actually, it's like their, the parent lost a daughter. And if they had lost a daughter, the other family had gained. And so this daughter was to be treated in a way that um, was... Uh, uh, very special. It was reasonable there for the father of the bride receive the equivalent of her value as a useful member of uh, the family. In the course of time, the mohar lost its original meaning as a purchase price paid to the father for his daughter and assumed the significance of a gift to the near relatives of the bride. As far as back in early biblical times, it was cost customary for a good father to give the whole of the mohar or at least a large part of it to his, to his daughter. And this is what I said, that after paying the dower on the day of wedding, half of it was returned. Now, the, the men who are listening right now, I, I hope, and they are not married, I hope you are not going to tell your father-in-law that on the day of wedding, you will return to me half of what I'm giving you. 
he, he will chase you away. Just let it pass, let it roll, as we say. Uh, you don't want war again. We, we are so late in the earth's history to be fighting once again with the things of the world when the world is coming to an end. And so a father who appropriated the whole mohar for himself was considered unkind and harsh. Um, and so in Leviticus 27, 30, and all the type of the land of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree belongs to uh, Elohim. It is set apart to, uh, uh, to Elohim or it was returned to the Levites. And so uh, whatever you had gained, this was the teaching that uh, at least it had to be returned. You didn't have to take the whole of it. And uh, uh, now, when you had agreed on the on the weight on the on the bride price, you did not just pay the exact bride price because you understand that bride price was going to come back to you. For you to show you are you are converted, actually. We are told that, um, look at this. One on top of the mohar, that is the bride press, the groom will give costly gifts called the matan to the bride as a sign of his commitment and as a sign of his promise to return for her. And so a man who really loved the lady did not just give the bride price, but accompanied with it with um some gifts that will not be returned. Those who are not to be returned, but just an appreciation that uh, really I love your daughter and uh, I'll be coming back for her. And, um, and so we see the Matan and the Mohar in the scripture in Genesis chapter 34, verse 11, where uh, Shechem says to the, the father of Dina and the, the brothers of Dina, and Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say uh, uh, to me, I'll give. Ask me a bride price, mohar, and a gift, matan, ever so high, and I give according to what you say to me, but give me the girl for a wife. That is uh, Genesis 34:12. That um, there was um, the mohar, the bride price, and the matan, the gifts uh, for the parents. And so, I pray that um, we shall continue learning. And once all this stipulation had been agreed upon, the proceedings of the betrothal could concur. Okay. The groom and his father would go to the bride's father's house and knock on the door. The bride's decision then be made known by whether the door was open or not. And so this was uh, the second part of um, the Jewish wedding model. And um, in the next session, we shall be going through uh, this period of engagement, the 12 months of after you had paid the bride price. What will you do and what will you not do during these um, uh, 12 months after paying the bride price and you are not living with uh, the wife? And so uh, I'm glad that uh, we can learn. I know today it was so fast, but uh, I'll try to low, uh, slow down uh, in the next presentation. What I want to say is this, that uh, the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew wedding model was something so important that um, it defined the spirituality of these people who are entering into marriage. And uh, you can look at the family of Jacob, how it was conducted and what was the aftermath of that family spiritually. You can also look at Adam and you can also look at Isaac and then how it went and then come to our days and compare how these things are being done and how they are affecting people and why there are so many divorces, why there are so many separations because the Bible is no longer a rule and a guide of life today, but people will want to do things because it pleases them as Samson did. But if we will consider things as they will please God, then we will avoid all this separation and divorce. In fact, we shall reduce them to the significant number. And so I pray for those who have married 
and those who have not married that we shall consider this information because it's a learning curve to both of us. And uh, whenever the Lord brings us information, it is to test us with that information because we shall not be tested with the truth we have never received or heard of. We are only tested with the truth we have received. And so may God be with us. May he give us the strength to make the right choices in life, to consider his word as he is bidding us to do. We are living in end times and we are told that some of these marriages are a sign of end times, the way they are conducted, the courtship and marriages. It's a sign of the end time. So I pray that um, whatever step that we shall take, it will be pleasing to God. It will be pleasing to the community. It will be pleasing to our parents. And we shall keep ourselves pure because Christ is going to take a spotless church, a pure church to his father. And any kinds of uh, fornication, be it spiritual or physical, it is actually uh, disqualifying ourselves from being the true bride of Christ. And so may the Lord bless us and let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, uh, I thank you because uh, you want to save us. From Genesis to Revelation, you have given us a love story in the Bible, the love that you have for your church. And this love has to be replicated in the marriages. And so I pray that uh, we may study the Bible with uh, the motive of not defending ourselves but with the motive of uh, doing thy perfect will. So give us the strength. The words we have heard that the enemy may not come and snatch them from us. Be thou our shield and the guide. And Father, if you will be the captain of our life, we know that we shall be safe and the ship shall land safe at the harbor. And so glory be unto thy name because you have called us not to destroy us, but Lord to save us. And so save us this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.